into our third installment of our November message series talking about divine denials. And uh, I've subtitled this message, Dumber Than a Donkey. And before my wife exits the room, let me just say, baby, I think you're a young adult because I'm not dumber than a donkey, okay? You are a young adult. You got to get those in everywhere you can, gentlemen, anywhere you can. You got to look at those things as a setup. You know what I mean? It's like volleyball, bump set, spike, okay? All right. So dumber than a donkey, I want to talk to you guys about a message that, uh, a, a scripture passage that's going to be familiar to many of you when you think about uh, Balaam and his donkey. And so, but for some of you today, this might be a brand new message, a brand new text in God's word for your life. And so we're going we're gonna to recap the story a little bit as we get started, just to make sure that we're all together on the same page. And so here's some background uh, on the story. So Israel, God's chosen people, they're headed towards the promised land, okay? Uh, how many know that you need to always begin something with the end in mind? Amen. You need to begin something with the end in mind. And oftentimes, when we lose track and lose sight of our goal, uh, that's how we wind up off path, okay? And so keep that in mind as we go throughout this this message today that we've got to begin with the end in mind and Israel, God's chosen people, they are headed towards the promised land. And it's taking a little while, but uh, as they come up against any opposing nation, God favors them. He gives them wisdom. He gives them insight. He gives them strategy in battle. And then at times he, he supernaturally intervenes on their behalf to help them get the victory. And so the Israelite people, they're absolutely decimating anybody that stands in their way. Anybody that opposes them, they are completely decimating those troops. And so currently in our narrative, they're on an incredible winning streak. I mean, they are an unstoppable force. They are headed to the promised land and nothing and nobody is going to stand in their way. And so at this point in time, they find themselves in the nation and the area of Moab and the Moabite king, his name is Balak. And he hears that the Israelites are coming, and he's obviously worried for good reason because he feels like, okay, we're next. We saw the, the path of destruction. We saw how they conquered all of these other enemy armies that have tried to oppose them, and he thinks we are next. And so what he does is he strategizes a preemptive strike. He says, I'm not going to wait for the Israelites to come at us. I'm going to come at them. And so he is uh, all guns blazing. He's ready to go, ready to fight. And so the Israelites, they have this reputation of leaving no one alive who would not acknowledge their God or adhere to his standards. Now, before we go any further, for those that may not have a biblical understanding, uh, especially of the Old Testament, you, you have to realize that uh, battle was, was really how territory was taken. It was how victory was secured. But you have to realize, too, that with the Israelites coming out of Egyptian slavery and wandering in the wilderness for many, many years, uh, they, were, they weren't out to try to attack people. They weren't out to try to conquer people. They weren't out to pick a fight with people. They were trying to head to the promised land, but people would continually try to oppose them. Listen, you don't have to go pick in a fight with the devil today. You don't have to go pick in a fight with somebody in your life today. I'm telling you that when you have a laser focus on the mission that God has set before you, the enemy will come and try to oppose you. Come on, he will try to oppose you. But the word of God says that when he comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. And so we don't need to fear. But you better be prepared because just like the Israelites, you are God's people. You're God's people. If you're in Christ Jesus today, you're God's chosen child. You are his son. You are his daughter. You have a mission, and as you are about your father's business, the enemy is going to try to oppose you, but just like the Israelites, God is on your side. God is going to intervene. God is going to give you the wisdom, the strategy, the insight, everything that you need to walk in victory. And so Balak's worried, understandably, but he hears about this guy who dwells in his land, and his name is Balaam. Okay, so don't get these two confused. Balak, king of Moab. Balaam, different dude. Okay, keep it straight. So Balaam, Balaam is a seer or a prophet of sorts. Okay, and so he would be consulted by many people. In fact, he was internationally known. And, and I won't do the rest of the rap lyrics. You don't want me to do that this morning. I'll leave that to Blake. I heard you've got some rap songs up your sleeve. We'll have to debut those here. But, but he's internationally known and, uh, and other countries, other leaders, they would come and they would consult with Balaam and they would ask him, they would inquire of him 
to, to give a, a prophetic decree, to, to uh, pronounce a cursing upon their enemies. And this was very standard in the day. And it wasn't just through people like Balaam, but they had many methods by which they would try to tell the fortunes or hear from the gods, if you will. And so Balaam was just one of many ways that people would try to determine the future or to pronounce cursing or blessing. And so they would approach this man named Balaam, a seer or prophet of sorts. And so uh, Balaam, by the way, is not just a, a random name that you know, was just briefly mentioned in some obscure text, but rather eight books of the Bible mention Balaam. Eight books. 59 times his name appears in scripture. That's more than Mary, the mother of Jesus, or any of the apostles of Christ. So I think that God's trying to get our attention. Uh, you will actually seldom hear a message in adult church about Balaam. You'll often hear this message maybe taught in a children's Sunday school class, and maybe that's where you've heard it. Um, but I believe that if God's going to mention Balaam that much in the scriptures, then we ought to talk about it. We ought to look into it. We ought to research what is it that God has for our lives through this story. And so that's what I aim to do today is to unpack this story of Balaam and apply it to our lives in this series that we're in, this November series talking about divine denials. And so the name Balaam actually means destroyer, destroyer. And so he was known for his curses. And so let's pick up the story now in Numbers chapter 22, beginning in verse 4. Reading out of the New Living Translation, it'll be on the screen for you if you need it. And it says this, Balak, king of Moab, sent messengers to call Balaam, son of Beor, who was living in his native land of Pithor, near the Euphrates River. His message said, look, a vast horde of people has arrived from Egypt. They cover the face of the earth and are threatening me. Please come and curse these people for me because they're too powerful for me. Then perhaps I'll be able to conquer them and drive them from the land. I know that blessings fall on any people you bless, and curses fall on people you curse. Balak's messengers, who were elders of Moab and Midian, set out with money to pay Balaam to place a curse upon Israel. They went to Balaam and delivered Balak's message to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you, Lord, for the on-time message that you have for our lives. God, we pray that we would have eyes that see God, when you stand before us, when you interrupt our path, God, when you, God, when you are announcing something to us, God, we pray that we would have eyes that see, God, ears that hear, that we would not miss a holy visitation from you, O oh God. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the transforming power of your word and of your spirit, and we invite you to speak into our hearts and our lives, personalize the message to each individual life today, we pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said... Amen. So we read here that the unique thing about Balaam was that uh, you could bring him some coin or some possessions, and for the right price, Balaam, who was a uh, professional soothsayer, professional, right? He did this for money. You could bring him some coin, and he would tell you what he sees or hears from the Lord. And so Balaam will bless whatever you desire to be blessed, and Balaam will curse the thing, people, crops, or whatever it is, whatever it is that you want to be cursed. And so if you've got a problem with one of your neighbors, Balaam's your guy, okay? Balaam is your guy. Hit him up, and things are going to get taken care of. And so uh, the king of Moab, he hears about this guy who dwells in his land, and he's like, hey, send some emissaries to Balaam, bring some coin, and ask him to give us a favorable result and curse the Israelites. And what you have to realize is these emissaries that Balak is sending out to go and inquire of Balaam, they had to travel somewhere between 400 and 450 miles just to go and speak with him, okay? So they went a great distance. They brought money with them, understanding that's what's required for Balaam. He does this not for free. He does this not for the glory of God. He does this to fatten his wallet, okay? And so these emissaries, they go to Balaam and they offer him some money. And Balaam says, okay, let me go and consult God and I'll let you know, okay? And so he goes and he prays to the Lord and God says, guess what he says? No. Come on, guys. This is the third week. No. No. God tells Balaam, no, absolutely not. Israel is my chosen people and I will always give them a favorable result. And so Balaam comes back to the emissaries and he's like, I oh, can't do it, guys. Sorry. So they go back to Balak and they tell him that Balaam has refused to curse Israel. And so Balak sends them back to Balaam another 450 miles. 
because he's not going to take no for an answer. He doesn't like the rejection, so he sends them back with more money, and Balaam consults the Lord again. Now, let me just stop right here. How many know that it is not necessary when God has issued a no to continue to come back to him again and again and again and again? If God has clearly said no, now I'm not talking about when he didn't answer. I'm not talking about when you're unsure. I'm talking about when you know that you know that you know in your heart of hearts, God has said absolutely not. Absolutely not. It is not necessary to keep going back to him. And so we can see already that Balaam has ulterior motives, right? He's not looking to please the Lord. He is looking to fatten his wallet, as I said, and he wants to do Balak's bidding for him. But the Lord is not allowing him to do that. So these guys go back another 450 miles with more money. Balaam consults the Lord again and then responds by saying, even if Balak were to give me his entire palace filled with silver and gold, I'd be powerless to do anything against the will of the Lord my God. So here we have Balaam, who is a conundrum in and of himself. He, he's, he's a mystery, really, because he, he actually hears from God. He actually has right prophecies, yet he doesn't have a right heart. Can I tell you that there can be some incredibly gifted people? There can be some people who seem like they carry an anointing, but if they don't have integrity, watch out, y'all. That's where the false prophets come from. It's not just people who say things that aren't true. It's people who say things sometimes that are true, but they have a wrong heart and a wrong motive and a wrong spirit about them like Balaam did. And so he said, but he says, look at these words. He says, he says, the Lord, my God. Interesting that he identifies the Lord as his God. He's not even an Israelite. He's, he's a Syrian. And yet he acknowledges that the Lord is God. And so, in other words, what he's saying here is that he couldn't promise Balak and the Moabites a favorable result. Then in verse 12, we see God really clearly, really explicitly prohibit Balaam from going with the Moabite emissaries. Numbers 22 and verse 12, it says, God told Balaam, do not go with them. You are not to curse these people, for they have been blessed. It's pretty clear, right? I mean, he, he's not tiptoeing around this thing. I mean, he is hitting it straight on. God is giving a very clear answer. You are not to curse these people, for they have been blessed. And then we fast forward just eight verses, and in verse 20, it begins this way. It says that God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the prince's of Moab, get this in verse 22, but God's anger was kindled because he went. So now God's mad at Balaam for going with the Moabite emissaries. And so we have to pause here for a moment. Didn't God just tell Balaam that he could go with the princes of Moab to go and meet Balak? Isn't that what we just read? And so the Lord is angry now with him for going, and there are two really important things that we have to understand about this text. If we're going to understand it rightly, there, these things are absolutely key. And so the first thing that is important to note is the operative phrase, if the men come to call you. If the men come to call you. Okay? And so it doesn't appear to me that they came when Balaam arose the next morning. I don't see any evidence of the fact that they came. Yet what does he do? He saddles up his donkey, and he goes anyway. He saddles up his donkey and he goes anyway. And so this reminds me of a story that I heard about a preacher and his wife. And, and so the preacher comes home one day and the wife is there and, he, and, and he says, hey, honey, we, we've got some big news, some big things that we need to pray about. I've got to pray about this, consult the Lord, see what his will is. You know, we've been pastoring this church for some time, but there's, there's another church that's called and they would like for me to come and pastor there. And, and the thing is, the church, it's bigger, it is a lot bigger uh, the people, they're richer. And, and, and the fact is, they're just a whole lot nicer. And so I, I, think, I think I need to consult the Lord about this. And so the, the wife says, well, well, no, don't you just go and consult the Lord. I'll come with you and we'll consult the Lord together. And the preacher says to his wife, no, honey, you stay downstairs and pack. I'll go pray. And so this is a lot, about, this is a lot like how Balaam was approaching God, right? He, he already had his mind made up. He wasn't really asking to get an answer. He already excluded no from, from the equation, from the conversation entirely. Like, like sometimes we decide for God what his yes and no is based on our whims, our wishes, the things that please us. 
And so here Balaam is doing that exact thing. And so sometimes, you know, we can get so driven by our own ambition. We can get so focused on creating our own success that we'll completely ignore what God is saying. We'll completely ignore it. And you, you see, this is, this is what I know. A conditional yes from the Lord is only a yes if you follow the conditions. And so otherwise it becomes a no. And so Balaam was not interested in following the conditions of the Lord. He got a conditional yes, but he treated it like it was an unconditional yes. And it actually became a no because he didn't follow the conditions. So today, maybe you get offered a job. A job opportunity comes knocking for you. And it looks to be very lucrative. The benefits are good. But you understand, man, I'm going to have to miss every single Sunday. Or I'm not going to get to see my family and my kids hardly at all. And so, you know, you have to decide, hey, am I going to be compromising my faith or my family for the sake of a job? We have these kinds of decisions that we're, we're, we're put into all the time, these kinds of decisions that we have to make on, on, between this and between that. And, and God gives us conditions of how we're to live our life. And so we're to prioritize him first. We're to put God first in all things. And to me, that means his house. His house comes first. And so we talked about it last week. My first ministry is not to my family. My first ministry is to the Lord. I am obligated to him. And then my family comes next before myself. My family comes next before my finances. My family comes next. And so we have decisions to make. Maybe it's a relationship. And you know this relationship isn't healthy. You know this relationship isn't leading to good places. You know that it's testing your boundaries and your purity. And you've got some decisions to make that maybe the Lord has said, yes, it's okay to entertain this relationship. But there are conditions that he places on it. There are boundaries that we need to be aware of. And if we just throw caution to the wind and give it an absolute yes instead of a conditional yes, Yes, we wind up in sin. We wind up doing things that are absolutely going to deprive us of the blessing of God. Maybe it's a business partnership. Maybe somebody somebody comes along and you think, man, this person's successful. I'm successful. Let's team up together and we can really do some great things. But you know that they're not a believer. You know that they have some shady business practices. You know that they they can be a little unethical at times. And so there are God might say, yeah, you can partner. But at the same time, he put some conditions and says, no, but, but my rules for your life, my guidelines, my ethics still apply. Don't be influenced by this other person. But if you say absolute yes and no conditions, you end up being influenced. And instead of you setting the tone in a godly way, you've got them setting the tone for your business and for your life in an ungodly way. And so the second thing we have to understand is that while in English it appears that God has contradicted himself, first saying don't go, and then saying go, we have to understand that in the Hebrew language the text was written in, these are actually two different words. Two different words. The first word in verse 12 is imahem, and it meant to go both physically and mentally. God said don't go with them in either way. And the second word in verse 20, etam, meant physically but not mentally. So God said go, but only in body and not in thought not in thought. In other words, don't allow your thinking to come into alignment with the ways of the Moabites. Don't allow their mindset to infiltrate yours. We're called to be in the world, but not of it. Amen. And and we have to be careful of who's setting the tone, who's influencing who here, right? And so listen, there are some things that you might have to go along with in the workplace. You might have to, you might have to endure some things at school or wherever it is that you're at, but the word of the Lord for you today is that you may have to go along physically, but you don't allow yourself to go with them mentally. You don't allow their mindset to infiltrate yours. Come on, there's some things right now with this whole pandemic that we have to tolerate in the workplace. I know there's several people here today in healthcare industries and different, different places where that becomes very relevant for you and you have to tolerate certain things, but you can't allow a mentality of fear, come on, to infiltrate your thinking. And so regardless of what industry you're in, regardless of what partnerships you have, we have got to make sure we guard our hearts and guard our minds that we might have to endure certain things, we might have to participate in certain things, we might have to go certain places physically But God says, don't you go there mentally. Don't you allow that thought and that mindset to infiltrate your mind and your heart. And so we have to keep God's voice central to everything that we think and everything that we do. And so with Balaam, we see he ignores the conditions that God first gave him. And as we will see, he goes with the Moabites both physically and mentally also. 
So he's now on his way to give Balak what he hopes is a favorable result, to curse Israel so the Moabites can survive and Balaam can get paid. Well, on his way, he's traveling on his trusty donkey, and an angel of the Lord appears, blocking the path ahead of Balaam. And so here, God is throwing down a holy stop sign in Balaam's path. He has come to interrupt the journey. This is something that Balaam needs to take note of and pay attention to. And so here this angel of the Lord is. He's fiery and bright and brandishing a sword, but there's just one catch. Only the donkey can see it. Weird, right? Only the donkey can see the angel. Balaam cannot see him. Well, seeing this, the donkey swerves to the left and winds up in a field, and Balaam gets frustrated. He hits the donkey to try to get her back on path. Then the donkey swerves to the other side, goes into a vineyard close to a wall. Balaam gets his foot crushed. He gets really angry, and he hits the donkey again. Some of y'all got a dog at home you do this to, right? And so Balaam gets the donkey back on path, and here he's faced with the angel that he still can't see, and the donkey bows low to the ground because the donkey can see the angel of the Lord. And so Balaam's pretty frustrated with the donkey by this point. She seems to be stubborn, and so he hits the donkey a third time. Now, at this point in the story, the donkey basically goes full Shrek mode, and uh, let's just read it here. Um, Pick it up in verse 28, and it says, Then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. And here's what it says. Um, and for some reason, I hear the donkey's words in the voice of Wanda Sykes. So if you know Wanda Sykes, just he- I'm not going to do the impersonation for you this morning. You just hear it in your own mind, okay? And so uh, the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak, quote, What have I done to you that deserves you beating me three times? It asked Balaam. You've made me look like a fool, Balaam shouted. If I had a sword with me, I'd kill you. But I'm the same donkey you've ridden all your life, the donkey answered. Have I ever done anything like this to you before? No, Balaam admitted. And so, I don't know about you, but it seems to me like this is not the first argument that Balaam has had with this donkey. (laughs) Like, if a donkey starts talking to me, I don't think I would immediately give a reply to what they've said. Why did it hit me? Well, because, you know, like, I I think I would be stunned, I'd be speechless, but no, he just has this conversation with the donkey, and, and it seems to me like he lost the argument, right? At the end of it there, have I ever done anything like this to you before? Balaam's like, no sorry, you're right. So he, dumber than a donkey, right? Continuing on, verse 31, then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand. Balaam bowed his head and fell face down on the ground before him. Okay, so Balaam's eyes have been opened. He sees the Lord. He responds by bowing. The angel of the Lord, he responds by bowing to him. And it says in verse 32, why did you beat your donkey those three times? The angel of the Lord demanded. Look, I've come to block your way because you're stubbornly resisting me. There's a word for what Balaam does here. There's a word for the way that he's conducting himself. And that word is rebellion. Balaam is on rebellion. He is, he is hell-bent on going against the will of God. Have you ever known somebody like that? Come on, they know the will of God, they know what's right, but it does not matter what you tell them, it does not matter what consequences befall them, they seem like they don't have eyes to see or ears that hear, and they are hell-bent on rebellion, and that is where Balaam is at here in our story. Yet, notice, Balaam bowed low as if in worship of the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord didn't correct him, as we see elsewhere in Scripture. Other times when there are angelic visitations, we see when someone tries to worship an angel, an angel will correct them and say, you don't worship me, I'm not God. That did not happen here in this case. So we have both the donkey and we have Balaam bowing in worship to the angel of the Lord. Verse 33, three times the donkey saw me and shied away, otherwise I would certainly have killed you by now and spared the donkey. This is what the angel of the Lord is saying. I would have killed you by now if it wasn't for that donkey. You should be thankful for that donkey you're kicking over there because if it wasn't for her, you'd be a goner. I'd have took you out, but I'd have have spared the donkey because the donkey's a whole lot smarter than you are, Balaam. And so the angel of the Lord is kind of trash talking a little bit. And so the angel of the Lord is clearly operating with autonomy, with the things that it's saying, and in their own authority here. 
Again, something that would be really out of the ordinary for an angel to come and just say, man, I could kill you, <laughs> you know? And, and he, this angel is making its own decisions, operating in its own power, receiving, accepting worship from Balaam and from the donkey, which leaves many scholars suggest that this may have been a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament or what we would call a Christophany. And so it very likely was the Lord himself who was interrupting the path of Balaam, that he would receive worship, that he would operate in such boldness and authority the way that he was. And in verse 34, it says, then Balaam confessed to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. Boy, that's a proper response when Jesus appears, isn't it? I have sinned. I didn't realize you were standing in the road to block my way. I will return home if you are against my going. But the angel of the Lord told Balaam, go with these men, but say only what I tell you to say. So Balaam went with Balak's officials. Isn't it interesting that at first it appeared that the angel of the Lord came and blocked Balaam's way, but then he tells him to go on ahead. He tells him to go on ahead. And so, of course, with certain stipulations, but what that shows me is that sometimes God throws down a holy stop sign to restrict us, and other times he does that to redirect us. And so no doesn't always mean I'm, I'm just stopping you dead in your tracks. You're not going to go any further. But sometimes that holy stop sign that God throws down in our path is to get our attention and to cause our perspective to shift, to cause our mindset, our paradigm to change, to come into alignment with his so that we will follow the stipulations that he gives us, those conditions for the yes that he has given to us. And so, but in either case, whether it's to restrict or to redirect, like Balaam, we can sometimes, we can act foolish and we can resist the no from God. We can resist the Lord because we don't see how he's using things to reroute our path. And so it can be as plain as day to everybody else, but when we become intent on doing something we know is against God's will, we can get tunnel vision. All of a sudden, we, we only see the thing that we want right in front of us. We don't see the peripherals anymore. All of a sudden, we have tunnel vision. We've zeroed in on that thing that we want, even though we know that it displeases the Lord. And so here's what I know. Resistance to God's no shows what our security is really in. That's what no does. It reveals to you where you find your security, where you draw your strength, your provision from, where you get your hope from. When you can't heed a no, there is an exposure in your life. It's exposing the things of your heart. And I love that about the Lord, that he goes past someone's gifting, he goes past someone's talent and ability like Balaam, and he goes all the way to the heart level, exposing the things that are hidden from all the people around they esteem Balaam highly, and they, they seek after his counsel and to hear from him about what he blesses and what he curses and all of these things. But God says, I'm not, I'm not a respecter of persons. I don't care about any of that stuff right now. I'm going to come straight for your heart. So, so people can be fooled, but God is never fooled. He sees right into the heart of a man. So Balaam's resistance to God's no, it revealed his desire for earthly wealth or opportunity over God's blessing. Listen, I love you as your pastor, but let me just tell you, if, if you have not yet trusted the Lord with the tithe, then you are trusting your own wealth and your own ability to earn living over God's ability to bless. God wants to bless you, and when you come into alignment with doing things his way, you find that, that his word is true. And he says, test me in this. See if I won't fling open the floodgates of heaven and pour down such a blessing in your lap that you can't contain it. It'll just overflow. And so we don't, we don't push offering heavy. We never guilt trip anybody. We want your giving to be a joy and not a burden. Amen. But God wants blessing for your life. God wants the best for you. And so we have to, not just in that area, but in all areas, come into alignment with what his word says about how to live a blessed life. And so here, Balaam was trusting his earthly wealth and opportunity over God's blessing. And so the no, again, it reveals our greatest affection and our greatest allegiance. And so we have to be really careful that we respond properly to the no, or I'm telling you, our heart gets laid bare before the Lord, and we start to see the ugly stuff that's really hiding inside of there. So there's a security in the no when you trust the one saying it. Come on, if, you, if it's God saying no, then you should know that that's good for your life. 
If you want God to always say yes to you, as I said in the first week, you're just going to wind up in an even worse predicament than you were in the first place, as is the fact with Balaam, as is the, the case with our world today. We want God to give us everything we ask for. We would be in a far worse predicament than we are right now as a nation and as a world. And so even, you know, some of our, our, our pursuits that aren't downright sinful, when we become hyper-focused on the path that we're on, we can lose sight of Jesus. This isn't just outright sin. This isn't just going after the things that are clearly demonic, clearly evil, clearly sinful. This is going after things that you might call good, but it's not God's best. Yeah. We can get so hyper-focused on things that we've deemed good, that we think will produce blessing in our life, when God has something better for us. And so we've got to be attentive to the Spirit of the Lord, and we have to be responsive to his yes, but also to his no. That's, that's why you need somebody in your life that's at least as smart and as bold as this donkey in our story to speak up and help you see that you have blind spots. Your own desires produce blind spots. The things that please your flesh, the things that please your own your own will and your own interests, those things create these areas where you can't even see the things that are coming at you, the enemies that are trying to attack you, the way that you're undermining your own success. You need somebody like this donkey in your life that can just speak some truth. Right. So finally, Balaam finishes his travels. He reaches Balak, and Balak tells him, look, whatever you need, it's yours. Just name your price, Balaam. I'll give you any amount of money. I just need you to curse the Israelites. So Balaam goes and prays and brings a result to Balak. And he comes back and says, sorry, still no. In fact, there's no price, as I said earlier, that'll change that because God's going to continue to bless the Israelites. So this happens three times where Balak offers enormous sums of money to Balaam to try and save his country, his people, and his position. And each and every time, the prophet, the seer, comes back, and when he opens his mouth, instead of cursing Israel, what does he do? All he can do is speak blessing. God fills his mouth. When he wants to speak cursing, all he can do is bless Israel. Can I tell you that it doesn't matter what the enemy is speaking over your life today? It does not matter what, what the gates of hell have planned for your life, for your home, for your family. All that matters is the voice of the Lord. And he is going to even use vessels that are not pure, vessels that are not godly. He's going to use any means necessary. He'll use a donkey. He'll use, he'll use a, a false prophet. He'll use anything and anybody to pronounce blessing and to speak his will over your life. And that's all that matters. But if you don't have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, then you will end up hearing that enemy voice, and you will wind up discouraged. I think the king of Moab was starting to get the point that there's no defeating the people of God. There's no standing against the holy name of Jehovah. If the enemy of God's advancement understood God's power, let me ask you this question. If the enemy of God's advancement understood his power, why is it that we can get so scared in the face of opposition when God is on our side? How is it that if we know that God is for us, that we can go into situations so fearful while the, the enemy understands very clearly, the enemy understands God's power and has a fear of God's power, then what in the world do we have to be afraid of? commander of the enemy army. He clearly understood the threat that the people of God posed. He had a fear of the might and the wrath of God. Yet how many times do we approach a battle with trepidation? How often have we backed down from the fight in fear of defeat? And so hear me today, when the enemy tries to pull out all the stops, when he seems to be rallying the troops against you, there should be a faith and a confidence that wells up on the inside of you that says, if my God is for me, who can be against me? That no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And so back up, devil. We've got to have that holy boldness that rises up on the inside of us because I'm telling you that victory starts with having a victorious mindset. Being a conqueror starts with having a conquering mentality, an attitude that says, I'm not going to back down. I know who is for me. Nobody can stand against me. So I want to tell you this. Don't let your enemy have greater belief in your potential for victory than you do. Don't let him have a greater belief in your potential for victory 
than you do. I think we often will do this. We will second guess ourselves. We will doubt, we will doubt ourselves. But the enemy all the while, why is he bringing an attack? Why is he coming at you the way he is? Because he knows the potential for victory that lies on the inside of you. He knows the, the greatness, the seeds of greatness that God has planted inside of you. And he wants to choke the life out of it before it can take root, before it can flourish, before it can manifest into victory the way that he knows that it will. It's only a matter of time. When, when you speak doubt, you're doing his job for him. When you start to speak negativity, when you sp start to speak doubt and fear, all you're doing is you're, you're speaking faith in the enemy's plan. It's just faith misplaced. What I love about this story is that the Israelites had no idea that the angel of the Lord had gone out on their behalf toward the enemy's plan. Now, Balaam knew, the donkey knew, the Israelites are completely unaware. They have no idea that the angel of the Lord has come to interrupt Balaam, to stop him dead in his tracks, and to protect them. So Jesus is out there throwing down holy stop signs on every assignment of hell in your life. He's using donkeys to make your enemy look dumb. And this isn't just a crazy random story, like I said, about some Old Testament guy. This story gives us a glimpse into the unchanging nature of God, that he's the one who never sleeps or slumbers. He dispatches angels on your behalf. He prays for you, and he's still undefeated in battle, friends. He is victorious. He's never lost a battle. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still for you and not against you. And not only does he tell you no when you need it, but he's telling every demon no when they come for you. And so we got to be thankful for the no of God because it's not just the no of God for us. When he speaks it to us, there's a no of God that is for us that we're not even aware of that he's speaking to every demon, to every attack, to every enemy. His no is protecting you, whether he speaks it to you or he speaks it to your enemy. His no is a protective covering. And so we need to have the no of God in our lives. Just like in Zechariah, the Lord not only dispatches angels on your behalf, but he sets a protective ring of fire around his people. When you know the word of God and you know what he's done for other people, when you know what he's done in times past, you can begin to claim those things for your life. Because if he's the same God that you serve, that they served, then what he did for them, he can do for you. You begin to come into agreement with the word of God and you, you begin to dispatch angels and walk on the authority that you have. You begin to claim that ring of fire on your life and watch, watch as God goes ahead of you and he wins the battle on your behalf. Oh, if you only knew the mighty army and weapons that are on your side today, if you only knew, because the people who know their God, they shall, they shall be strong and do great exploits, says the word of God. But if you don't know your God, if you don't know his unchanging character and nature, then you don't realize who you've got on your side. So Balaam represents in the narrative a man of great gifting, but little integrity. Someone who sought the hand of God, but completely ignored his heart. Balaam was quick to declare the actions that God would take, but he clearly didn't have a reverence for the divine attributes of the Lord Almighty. And so listen, we won't always be able to predict the actions of God. There's a lot of people who think they can. There's a lot of people who want to tell you what God is going to do next. But we won't always be able to predict the actions that God will take in a given situation. But hear me, we can always know his heart. We can always know his nature. We can always know his character. If you're in God's word, then, then his nature, his character, his attributes, they have been revealed to you. And you can always bank on that. Even when you don't know what the outcome of a situation is, those things are unchanging. Those things you can know. So knowing who God is and not just what he does gives, us, gives a person great confidence and resolve in the face of the many difficult trials of life. This is why it, it should be our passion and our desire that every person who doesn't know Jesus Christ come to know him. Come on. They are living in defeat. They are constantly being beat up, bombarded by the plans of hell, and they have no idea that there is an advocate. There is a fighter on their side who is just waiting to be tagged and called into the ring to fight with them. Amen? We, we have great weapons, great power, a great advocate on our side. And there's people who have no idea that that's available to them. The psalmist understood it, though, and that's why he said this, that I have set the Lord continually before me, and because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. 
I will not be shaken. It's about trusting that God's already worked out whatever you're worried about. He's already worked it out. He's already in your tomorrows. He's already there. He knows the end from the beginning. And that's how you can have peace in the midst of any situation. You don't have to have your heart be troubled when you know that God is at your side. Now, on the third time of Balaam prophesying, something's revealed to us, the readers, that we might not have realized the first time, uh, first two times through. And the first verse of chapter 24 begins this way. It says, by now, Balaam realized that the Lord was determined to bless Israel, so he didn't resort to divination as before. Amen. Divination. First of all, let me tell you that the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of divination. It should be no surprise that this man isn't really a prophet of God, but he is a sorcerer, that he is uh, operating in witchcraft because he is rebellious. His heart is bent on rebellion, and so divination goes hand in hand with that. And so we discover he's not a prophet of God, he's a sorcerer, one who prophesies, but hear me, he mixes magic in with it. Yes, he talks about the Lord our God. He talks about Jehovah. He talks about the one true God. He prays to the one true God. He hears from the one true God. He speaks on behalf of the one true God at times, and yet he mixes his own ways, his own methods in there. You see, his motives aren't pure. His goal isn't to please God. He himself, as I said, was not an Israelite, yet he had a fear of God and called him his Lord. Balaam was familiar with God's power, and he feared it, but he wasn't familiar with God's love. He didn't have a relationship with him. And so anytime you have a familiarity with God's power, but not his love, what you'll get is a manipulation of his will that serves your interests and not his. And that's exactly what Balaam was doing. He's trying to manipulate the situation to get the outcome that he wants because he wasn't in relationship with the Lord. And so can I tell you, there are a lot of people like Balaam today, people who like to mix in their own methods with a faith in God. Can I tell you that's every bit as demonic as what Balaam was doing? When we mix in our own methods, mix in our own wisdom, mix in our own ways in with what we know God is telling us. Well, I'll, I'll partially obey what God's calling me to do here, but I'm still going to rely on my own provision, my own strength, my own methods as well. We can, we can couple the two together. We can mix those things up a little bit. That'll be okay. I'm telling you, it's not okay. It's not okay to mix things up like that. God wants our whole life, our whole heart set apart for him. Our God is a jealous God. That's what the Bible says. He's a jealous God. And so if we've got something else sitting on the throne of our hearts today that we bow down to, that we listen to, that we obey, that is not the voice of God, I'm telling you, he wants to kick that thing to the curb. That thing's got to go. Don't justify you mixing your methods. God says that is not of him. That is just like Balaam. People who are rebellious in nature but want God to pronounce blessing. Can I tell you, I, I've, got, I've got a wedding on, on my calendar, and I'm super excited about it. What they might not know and what you might not know is, besides a vow renewal, I've never done one. My wife's done a few. But here's, there's a reason for that. Because I'm not going to allow somebody to just say, you know, we want to live in rebellion, but will you just pronounce blessing on that thing? It's not that people haven't asked me. People have asked me. But when I've counseled with them, they won't come into agreement with the will of God for their lives. Even for two weeks. For two weeks, can you commit to live for God? Can you commit to do the right thing? I want to bless you. I want to bless this union. But you've got to put God first because I'm not going to bless no mess. Okay? And so there's, there's been some times. But, but that's exactly what Balaam was doing, and that's what this spirit, if you will, is all about, is, is being bent on rebellion but wanting God to bless it. We can't just live any old way we want and ask God to bless that thing. We've got to come into alignment with the Word of God, and that is what he will bless. Listen, it doesn't matter how many times you ask God to bless you when you're living in unrepentant sin and rebellion. You know what you'll get? Cursing. Every time. I'm telling you, this is a universal spiritual law that each and every time a man will reap what he sows. Every single time. And, and, and for some people, it takes 100, 200, 300 times uh, of doing it before they finally connect the dots. Wow, I'm just reaping what I've been sowing. Oh, maybe if I sow something different, I'll get something different. And so we need to sow in obedience to the, to the word of God. 
the Old Testament isn't the only place where we find Balaam mentioned. In Revelation, God addresses the church in Pergamum. Uh, Revelation 2 and verse 14, here's what it says. And this really helps us to understand what Balaam was about and, and kind of wrap up the story, if you will. It says, but I have a few complaints against you. This is the Lord speaking. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. I've come to doubt, tell you today that there is still a spirit of Balaam that is at work in our culture, in our society today. It, it operates in this world and it's a spirit of compromise, a spirit of sin, a spirit of idolatry. And we've got to see that that spirit of Balaam is still at work today, a spirit that says it's okay to commingle a little religion with a little rebellion. It's not, friends. It's not okay to commingle rebellion with religion. A spirit that says we can embrace both the power of God and the love of this world. Balaam couldn't pronounce cursing over the Israelites. He knew that no one could stand against him, against them because the favor of God was on them. He knew an attack against their military would never work, but he also knew that an attack on their morality could work. He didn't launch a military attack. He knew exactly what was going to happen. The Lord was very clear. The Israelites would prevail. But he knew if I can attack, if I can assail their morality, their values, if I can come at their beliefs, if Balak could just get the Israelites to compromise in sin, they would forfeit the favor of God themselves and bring themselves to ruin. Can I tell you, the enemy is working the same way today, trying to water down the message of the gospel trying to water down the power of God's spirit, trying to come against the church, not through the outward attacks that we always are looking for, looking for it to come through politics, looking for it to come through other faith groups, looking for it to come from atheists or whatever you usually put in that blank of where you think that attack is going to come from. I'm telling you that this spirit of Balaam is where the attack really comes from. It's where he's going to attack your morality. He's going to try to cause you to compromise. He's going to try to cause you to mix a little rebellion with a little religion. And if he can get you to do that, I'm telling you, even though God calls you blessed, when you come into agreement with sin and with compromise, you bring the curse on yourself. You, you step out from underneath the umbrella of God's protective covering. His will is his protective covering. You're walking in his will, not in perfection, hear me, but with a heart that is tender to the Lord that when he shows up on your path, that you are not blind to it, that you don't ignore it, that you don't try to go around him this way and go around him that way. But when God throws down a holy stop sign, it gets your attention and you heed the warning. That's all I'm talking about, a heart that is tender to what God says in his word and by his spirit. And make no mistake, he is still speaking no to his children today and it is always for your good. It is always a protective no that is in your best interest. So the Israelites were instructed by the Lord to remain separate from the Moabites, the Edomites, the Ammonites. But what happened was the Israelites began to commingle with the Moabites, engaging in sexual sin, committing idolatry, bringing curses on themselves. Remember, they were on a journey. They had one destination, one goal in mind. We are just going to the promised land. And they weren't supposed to engage in battle. I mean, if they were attacked again, God's going to be their defender. But they were meant to just skirt those enemy nations on their way to the promised land. One mission, one goal, one destination. This would have been the ultimate victory for the Israelites to no longer dwell in slavery, to no longer wander in the wilderness. This would impact generations. Their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren would be talking about this and continuing to live in the blessing of God. Church, the enemy knows he can't defeat us when we're on God's side. And he also knows if we'll compromise with sin, we will forfeit God's favor. We have to take a lesson, take a page out of the Israelites' book here. Look and learn from the lessons and the mistakes that they've made so we don't have to make the same ones. That's why a lot of these stories are in here because God's trying to warn us. He's giving us a story of warning and saying, don't go that way. Don't go the way of the Israelites who, who embraced the spirit of Balaam. 
because it was that same spirit of compromise that Balaam had. It was that same double allegiance, that divided heart and divided mind that all of a sudden infiltrated the Israelites. And now they too are divided. Now they too are committing idolatry. Now they too are committing sin. And now they too have pronounced cursing upon their lives. It's no coincidence that it was on the precipice of their greatest breakthrough that the enemy would bring his greatest spiritual assault. For some of you today, you might feel like you're under assault, you're under attack. And I'm telling you, the enemy knows when we're on the precipice of breakthrough. He knows when we are on the verge of crossing over into the promise. And he pulls out all the stops at the 11th hour to try to stop us just short of walking in that blessing and that victory that God has purposed for our lives. Friends, God's will and his mind about you has not changed. He still speaks blessing and victory over your life. Will you come into agreement with that word today? Stop professing fear and doubt over your situation. Stop entertaining other, other influences and interests. Stop commingling religion and rebellion. And listen, I know a lot of us, we don't want to call things rebellion in our lives. Instead, we find ways to justify it and give it cute little names. Allow the Spirit of God to minister to you today. Allow Him to work on your heart. Maybe there's an area of rebellion that you've not been calling rebellion, but God wants to throw down a stop sign today and help you realize that you've been resisting Him. And anytime we're resisting Him, that's code for rebellion. It's code for rebellion. Would you stand on your feet this morning as we get ready to close? You know, the Bible's really clear. God is really clear in his word. He says, be holy as I am holy. I, I believe that it's time that the church of Jesus Christ stop watering down the truth. Stop compromising on the word of God, compromising on the truth, approving of and supporting things that are completely contrary to the word of God. And so we need to not compromise on the truth. But can I tell you today that there are a lot of people who will boldly declare truth, but what they will do is they'll compromise on love. And what they'll do is they will attack the very lost world that we are called to come and help save. We have to be careful that we don't compromise on truth, but we also have to be careful that we do not compromise on love. Launching a military assault and attack on every single person that, that doesn't believe like we believe. Make no mistake, the Israelites, as they're passing through these nations, these nations are idolaters. These nations are pagan. These nations are rebellious to God. But they don't come in to try to launch an assault and attack them and tear them down. They're just trying to pass through onto their promise. When you're on your mission, when you know the end that God has for you, when you know the promise that lays before you, church, we still have one mission today. It's to seek and to save that which is lost. We're to partner with Jesus on that mission, to evangelize the world, to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything that Jesus has taught us. That hasn't changed. But I believe that the church has lost its footing when we've compromised on truth or we've compromised on love. Would you bow your heads this morning as we get ready to close? There's some specific people that I want to address. There's some certain situations that I believe the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on this morning. Because God's word, it reveals and it compels us to change. If you get nothing else out of this message today, I want you to at least leave with this, that if you're a believer, no one can curse you today, no one but yourself. No one but yourself. There's no devil in hell, there's no demonic stronghold, there's no nothing that can come against you, a blood-bought child of God. The only one that can come against you is you. So I want to challenge you right where you are today that this word would have a compelling change in your life. Maybe you have a call of God on your life and it's, it's for God's glory, it's for your good, and it's for the good of others. And you've, you've maybe said a partial yes to the, to the call of God, but you haven't fully sold out to it today. You've been commingling obedience and disobedience. And today the Lord would say, okay, are you going to finally give me your unconditional yes? Whatever that call looks like, can look like many things. But whatever God is 
calling you to do for him, for his namesake. Stop rehearsing all the ways that you're incapable, that you're not qualified. Stop rehearsing all the fear of how you think you might mess it up and just respond to the word of the Lord and give him your yes today. Maybe for some of you, there are voices that you need to change in your life, voices that are influencing you, enticing you, causing you to compromise on your convictions. Maybe there's some relationships that need severed. Maybe there's some websites that need blocked. Whatever it is, to turn off the noise, to turn off the distractions, to turn off that voice that is opposing the voice of God in your life. And then finally, if there may be any unrepentant sin in your life today, You've tolerated some things that you know you're not supposed to tolerate. I believe God is issuing a call to repentance. A call to repentance because that's where newness of life is found. There's no life found in sin. Life is only found in repentance, turning from our wickedness and turning to God. And so my question is, has God stopped you in your tracks today? Is there a divine interruption in your heart where God's calling you to reroute your journey? I have a feeling that God could find guilt with each one of us here today, with each and every one of us. And so we need his mercy. We need the forgiveness that he offers through Jesus. And so if any of these areas have applied to you today, I want to invite you to respond to this altar. Father, we thank you today, God, that you are for us and not against us. God, we declare your rule and your reign, God, in every area of our hearts. God, every area where we have tolerated something, Lord, that is not pleasing to you, God, any area that we have commingled, any area where we have unrepentant sin, God, we lay that before you. God, we make a fresh commitment to you, and we speak your rule and your reign first in our hearts, oh God, that you are enthroned, God, upon our hearts, you and you alone. God, we will give you the praise. We will sing hallelujah to you and you alone, oh God. God, let your rule and your reign be established, not just in our hearts, but God, from that place, may it, may it be established in our lives as well. God, in our workplace, in our homes, in our families, God, with our children, our grandchildren, in our marriages, God, let your rule and your reign be established, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. God, we speak victory. We speak promise. God, we speak, Lord God, that you are in every detail. We declare that today, that if you be for us, who can be against us? God, we declare the no of God over every demonic attack. We declare the no of God over everything, God, that would try to set itself up against you and against your people, oh God, today. We speak victory, God, that they are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. God, we look to you. You are where our help comes from. God, you are where our strength comes from. You are our wisdom, God. You are our rock and shield today. God, remind your people, God, you are their defender. As we go out from this place, Lord God, set a ring of fire about your people, Lord. God, there is no plan of the enemy. There is no attack from the gates of hell that will prevail in their lives, God, because they look to you. You fight the battle on their behalf, and they have victory today by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord. We will walk in agreement with that. And God, we have a laser focus today on the mission that you have set before us. God, to go out and make disciples. God, to seek and save that which is lost. God, that is your mission and it becomes our mission. God, give us eyes that see God, what is right in front of us and let us respond with hearts of compassion. God, that, God, that we would take territory for your kingdom and we would do so, God, with love and we would do so with truth. God, balancing both hand in hand, not compromising on the full gospel of Jesus Christ. God, bless your people as we go out from this place. Let us be encouraged today, God, that you go before us, that your no is always for our good, and we give you our yes today, Jesus. We love you. Amen and amen.